Okay, so hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the clinical examination of the optic nerve or the second cranial nerve. So before we go into it, remember we're going to discuss this in four headings. That is visual acuity, visual fields, color vision and fundus examination. Fundus examination additionally, uh, postgraduates is very very important. Undergraduates, it's enough if you know about visual acuity, visual fields and color vision. Okay, now coming to visual acuity. So what is visual acuity? Basically visual acuity is the ability of the eyes to resolve images. So we're going to measure this ability of the eye to resolve images. So obviously we're going to be checking each eye separately. For distant vision, we're going to be using the Snellen chart. We're going to be using the Snellen's chart. And the other chart is early treatment in diabetic retinopathy study chart. For near vision, we're going to be using near cards. Commonly used one is Jager's reading card. And the other one is Rosenbaum pocket vision screening card. Okay, so what is the clinical method of clinically examining the visual acuity. So you place your sternal chart 6 meters away from the patient. So why 6 meters? It's because at this distance accommodation is relaxed and most of the rays are going to be parallel. So cover one eye and ask the patient to read the chart from top to down until they cannot read any further and repeat this for the other eye. So in case the patient's not able to see the largest font in the chart, reduce the test distance to 3 meters. If still the patient's not able to read, reduce it to 1 meter. And if the patient's not able to see the largest font even at 1 meter, that time you should document the visual acuity as ability to count fingers. If still not able to count fingers, ability to perceive hand movements. And if the patient's also not able to perceive hand movements, you'll have to document whether the patient has absent or present light perception. Okay. Now what is a pinhole test? So this is very important. So what you do is you place a pinhole directly in front of the eye to see if the visual acuity improves or not. So if it's going to be a pure refractive error, the visual acuity is going to improve. But if the visual acuity is not improving with pinhole, it means that the, law, the reduced visual acuity is not purely because of a refractive error alone. There's something else going on in the retina, the optic nerve. So that's the importance of pinhole test. So pinhole test, visual acuity is improving, it's a refractive error. If it's not improving, there's something wrong with the retina or the optic nerve. Next coming to visual field examination. So the test that we use over here is known as confrontation test. So we're going to use the confrontation test. So before we go ahead to the confrontation test, what are the prerequisites? So number one, the patient's visual acuity should be checked and there should be at least finger counting. At least finger counting should be there and also you have to assume that your visual field is normal. So taking these two prerequisites, we can go ahead and do the confrontation test. And Viva question, what is a normal visual field? It's 160 degrees horizontally and 130 degrees vertically. And it's 90 to 100 degrees temporally and 60 degrees nasally. 50 to 60 degrees superiorly and 60 to 75 degrees inferiorly. So if you notice, the temporal and inferior fields are going to be more compared to the nasal and superior fields. So what are you going to use for the confrontation test? Your fingers are more than enough. Your fingers are more than enough. But in case you want to have a more precise visual field examination, you can use a hat pin or a neurotip. And if you're going to use a red hat pin or a red neurotip, it's going to be even more precise. Okay, now coming to the uh, method of examining. So you'll be sitting across the patient at the same level around one meter away and test each eye separately. Okay, so you're going to ask the patient to close or cover one eye and look directly across to your opposite eye and you also should close your other eye. Next, you hold out your hands and bring an extended finger. And remember, it's very important when you're bringing your finger from the periphery towards the center of the visual field, you'll have to wiggle it because the uh, peripheral vision is more sensitive to moving objects rather than static objects. It's more sensitive to moving objects. So it's very important that you uh, move your finger or wiggle your finger as you bring it from the periphery towards the center of the visual field. And remember that the testing finger or your hand should be kept at a plane exactly halfway between yourself and the patient. And like I mentioned earlier, a hat pin or a neurotip is going to be more preferable for checking visual fields. And if you're going to use a red color hat pin or neurotip, it's going to detect very early visual field issues and you can also check for the optic nerve dysfunction because red desaturation is the first color change that occurs in optic nerve dysfunction. So in case you have this, you can uh, might as well bring it to the examination hall. Okay, very important, you're going to check all the four quadrants separately. So uh, supratemporal, inforotemporal, supranasal, inforonasal, you're going to check all four quadrants separately. 
Okay, now coming to color vision. So color vision, very simple, you're going to use color plates or pseudo isochromatic plates. The most common one is going to be your Ishiara chart. The other one, it's okay, just know the name, it's enough, Hardy Ritter Rand chart. Okay, now coming to direct ophthalmoscopy. So this is very important for PGs. You will be surely questioned on direct ophthalmoscopy. So don't forget to bring your well challenged ophthalmoscope to the exam. So while using the direct ophthalmoscope, if you're going to examine the patient's right eye, you should hold the ophthalmoscope with your right hand, use your right eye to examine. And similarly, for the left eye, when you're going to examine, it's going to be the same. So ask the patient to sit upright and look at a distant target. Very, very important. The patient should not be looking at your light source from the ophthalmoscope. Because if he's going to uh, look at your light source, when you uh, perform the direct ophthalmoscope, you're going to focus on the macula. But you want to focus on the optic nerve disc first. You want to, uh, you want to uh, focus on the optic disc. So it's very important you ask the patient to look at another distant target. Place your free hand on the patient's forehead and brow to stabilize the patient's head. Next, use your ophthalmoscopy and once you reach a distance around uh, 10 centimeters when you're approaching the patient, you'll be able to visualize a red reflex. So once you visualize the red reflex, look for any opacities there itself. If it's going to be a static opacity, most likely it's cataract. If you're going to have mobile opacities, it's going to be vitreous opacities. So slowly move your ophthalmoscope more closer to the patient and finally you'll reach a point where your forehead is going to touch your thumb which is stabilizing the patient's head. Next, adjust the lens dial in the ophthalmoscope till you focus on the optic disc or a retinal blood vessel. Okay, in case you're focusing on a retinal blood vessel, no issues. Just have to follow the vent, uh, vessel centrally till you reach the optic disc. Okay, now what you have to do if you want to visualize the macula. Okay, so once you've finished examining the optic disc, what you do is briefly you ask the patient to focus on the light source from your ophthalmoscope. That time you'll be able to visualize the macula. So you remember you have to uh, examine the macula at the end after examining the optic disc. Okay, now coming to the Viva questions. So, uh, you're going to be asked about what is the visual pathway. So, this is very easy. Optic nerve, then the optic chiasma, optic tract, lateral geniculate body, optic radiation and the visual cortex. This is the visual pathway. So, what are the visual field abnormalities? Okay, so remember that uh, images from the left visual field are going to come to the nasal retina. And similarly, from the right visual, visual field, it's going to come to the temporal retina. Okay, so now based on this, we can uh, figure out what are the different visual field abnormalities at different levels. So for example, if you're going to have a optic nerve lesion over here. So what are the visual field defects you're going to have? On that side, you're going to lose your entire visual field in optic nerve lesions. Okay, in case you're going to have an optic chiasma lesion. So if you notice over here, the nasal fibers from each optic nerve are crossing over. So when you have a lesion of the optic chiasma, both your nasal crossing nasal fibers are going to get affected, which are carrying which are carrying uh, uh, images from the temporal field. So you're going to have bitemporal hemianopia. You're going to have bitemporal hemianopia. Okay. Now, in case you're going to have a lesion in the optic tract over here, you're going to have lesion in the optic tract. So the same side temporal fibers are going to get involved so this side nasal field is going to go and the cross nasal fibers are gone so that side temporal field is gone okay so you're going to have this is the type of visual field abnormality you're going to have okay coming to optic radiation so it depends if you have a superior optic radiation abnormality so remember the superior optic radiation is going to go through the parietal lobe so that time you're going to have an inferior quadrant anopia you're going to have an inferior quadrant anopia if you're going to have superior optic radiation involvement. In case you're going to have inferior optic radiation involvement. So the inferior optic radiation is actually present in the temporal lobe. So that time you're going to have a superior quadrant anopia. So this is known as pi in the floor and this is known as pi in the sky. Okay, important questions. Next, finally, if you're going to have an abnormality in the visual cortex, what you're going to have is, you're going to have a homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing. You're going to have a homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing. Okay, so these are important visual field abnormalities. So what are the color vision abnormalities? The most common one is going to be color blindness, also known as achromatopsia. So color blindness is basically an X-linked disorder that is seen in males and around 3 to 4 percentage of all males. So it's pretty common. Next, optic neuritis, very, very important. And remember in optic neuritis, the first color vision abnormality you're going to get is red desaturation red desaturation very very important you can also have green color deficiency but the first and most important one to go is red color 
Now coming to direct ophthalmoscopy, so this is very important for postgraduates. So remember two things that you should know in direct ophthalmoscopy. Number one is the uh, obviously the clinical method of examining, and next you should know about papilledema and you should know about optic atrophy and how to differentiate papilledema from pseudo papilledema. These are common viva questions they're going to ask. So what is papilledema? It's basically bilateral optic disc edema due to raised ICT. So raised ICT could be because of so many things. It could be because of a tumor, an abscess, tubercoloma, meningitis, or an idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So anything that's going to raise the ICT can cause papilledema. So can it be unilateral? So as you know, raised ICT is a bilateral process. So how can you have only raised ICT on one side? It's not possible. But you can get unilateral papilledema. That is known as Foster Kennedy syndrome. Foster Kennedy syndrome. So basically over here you have a frontal lobe tumor or an orifactory glue meningioma. So what happens is on the side of the tumor, you're going to get optic atrophy. Okay, on the side of the tumor, you're going to get optic atrophy. And on the opposite side, because of raised ICT of the uh, caused by the tumor, you're going to get papilledema. You're going to get papilledema. So since this side, on the, on the side of the tumor, you're having optic atrophy, this can't undergo papilledema. So only the normal side optic nerve on the opposite side, because of raised ICT, that will undergo papilledema. So unilateral papilledema is seen in Foster Kennedy syndrome. Another point in Foster Kennedy syndrome, remember that you'll have unilateral anosmia. So these are the features of Foster Kennedy syndrome. Unilateral anosmia, unilateral papilledema, and on the other side, on the side of the tumor, you're going to have optic atrophy. Next, what is disc edema? So disc edema also you're going to have edematous optic disc, but here it's going to be unilateral. So remember, papilledema is bilateral, disc edema is unilateral. So the cause of disc edema are optic neuritis, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. These are the two important causes. Others are optic nerve compression at the level of the orbit, diabetic papillopathy, optic nerve glioma, leukemia, sarcoidosis, and secondary metastasis. Okay. Next is the tricky part. How do you differentiate pseudopapilledema from papilledema? So what is pseudopapilledema? So in here, patients are going to have a normal vision, and absolutely no visual complaints. For some other reason, you uh, uh, they'll be doing a direct ophthalmoscopy from them, and you'll be seeing something which is like papilledema. The two most important causes of pseudopapilledema are optic nerve drusen and myelinated nerve fibers. So optic nerve drusen is present in 2% of the population, and remember, in 70% of the time, it's going to be bilateral making it even more tough for us. At least it's unilateral, we can we'll be able to differentiate. But in optic nerve drusen, 70% of the time it's going to be bilateral, making it very difficult to differentiate from pseudopapilledema. So the other causes are Bergmister's papilla, which is nothing but a remnant of the permanent, uh, primitive hyaloid artery, tilted optic disc, and extreme hypermetropia. Okay, now how do we differentiate both? So in papilledema, the disc margin is going to be hyperemic. Whereas the disc color is normal in pseudopapilledema. In papilledema, in the initial stages, you're going to have blurriness of the disc at the superior and inferior poles. Whereas in pseudopapilledema, the blurriness of the disc is irregular or it has a lumpy appearance. In papilledema, other than loss of other than loss of spontaneous venous pulsations, otherwise the blood vessels are normal. Whereas in pseudopapilledema, the blood vessels on the disc are abnormal. In papilledema, you're going to have hemorrhages, where hemorrhages are rare in pseudopapilledema. And very important point, the nerve fiber layer is dull in papilledema because the retinal vessels are obscured by retinal edema. Whereas the nerve fiber layer is normal in pseudopapilledema. So these are the important points to differentiate both. Sometimes it will be uh, very difficult to uh, differentiate, especially in cases of bilateral optic drusen. Okay. Now coming to optic atrophy. So optic atrophy is where the optic disc is pale, it's going to be sharply de demarcated from the surrounding retina and has a punched out appearance. So you can have primary optic atrophy when it appears de novo or it could be secondary optic atrophy due to some other disease of the optic nerve, for example, optic neuritis. So what are the causes of optic atrophy? So optic neuritis, glaucoma, these two are the most important causes. Then anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, trauma, chronic papilledema, Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy, nutritional deficiencies, toxins, optic nerve compression at the level of the orbit, and neurocephalus. So these are the important causes for optic atrophy. So this is about the uh, clinical examination of the optic nerve. Thank you.